Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Again, uh, again, you have you. Everyone is uh, self muted. So if you want to talk, just unmute yourself. You can talk. Feel free to talk if necessary. Uh, however, if you're not talking, again, uh, again, mute yourself so this eliminates any kind of background noise. Okay. So before we get started, um, there were two questions uh, that I have received, and I'd like to address them both. Uh, the first question was uh, about use to show you about using uh, with your tools. Uh, now, as far as uh, sh importing with your tools into the program, at this point, we don't have it. And I'm sure you can all say, oh, and you're right. However, um, in our next version, 2001, we have really uh, completely rebuilt our tool table and in that uh, version we have absolutely no problem uh, showing any um, tool table from any company as long as we have uh, if you send us an electronic uh, catalog of your uh, tool table then we have no problem putting it into the program itself and in one of these um, sessions that we're going to have, I also, I'm, I'm also going to invite uh, what the, one of the people in our company over here to actually show you the new tool table, uh, how it will look, uh, and how everything could be worked with different uh, tools from different uh, catalogs and so on and so forth. So if someone in, on your team can send me uh an electronic catalog uh link to an electronic catalog then we can definitely put it into our new version and it's really really those things really work well uh in our new tool table okay so i can't show it to you now because uh we were unable to do it we did not have an electronic one beforehand so we cannot do it uh at, at this point in this uh, version but the next version we can but like I said, please send me electronic um, or a link to a to your tool table so you can put that into our program. Okay. The question number two was about creating a block of thought uh, because as many people know, uh, many cases people have a block of stock and they create it and they also want to see the easy way of creating that stock without making say. Uh, an assembly and then bringing in the block and, and mating it and stuff like that. Uh, so how do you actually create stock with us? Uh, the easy way for doing it. Now, the, the, the one way, like I just started to mention, is if before you actually start the project, you can make a configuration with stock and then define the stock, define the target, as define your stock as the block in that configuration. But that's an involved issue. Also, if since we do work in an assembly mode, uh, you can always um, bring in a block in the assembly mode, and then uh, and then uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and then create the stock from that part. But there are a lot easier ways to do it, and we will be getting to that within in, in today's session. Uh, and the reason why I say we'll be getting into, I'm not going to show it to you right offhand, it's a very simple reason. What I'd like to do today is, in the past uh, sessions, what I basically showed you was uh, more like little demonstrations of, of what the program does. It showed you, explained a little bit about certain aspects of the program. But what I'd like to do now is I'd actually like to teach the actual program. And by doing that, I'd also like to go into different operations, also the, the whole setup in the very beginning, how everything is done. Uh, and this is important because this way you get a better feel of the program, not just a demonstration, but you also understand what's going on behind the scenes. So in order to do that, I'd like to actually start teaching the program. Uh, again, uh, whoever came in late, you, you're self-muted. And if you need to talk, um, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question uh, in the middle. I have no problem with that. Okay. 
So I'm going to start with this part that we have on our screen, which you're probably are familiar already with this part because I've used it several times, but there's a lot that you can actually learn on this part itself. Okay, before I start a new CAM project, I'd actually like to start at a different point. I like to start at the settings, okay? Just to see how this, what we do actually in the settings so you can understand why things happen in a specific way. How do I get into settings? There are several ways to get into our settings, into our solid cam general settings, I like to call that. Okay. There are one way, if you notice, we have on our task pane on the left hand side, which is solid cam. If I go further down over here, we have solid cam settings. Okay. Another way to go in, a simple way, is if I go to my tabs on my um, uh, tree over here, we have a solid cam tab. And even before I create a project, I have several things here before anything is even created. And one of the things here is this button here called solid cam settings. Okay. Uh, since I keep this open almost all the time, I prefer going solid cam settings over here, but it's, it's again, it's a matter of where you're more comfortable. Another way to get into solid cam settings is in my tabs on top over here. If I go to solid cam part, and again, I'm also going to try to go a little slower. Some people are saying I was going a little fast, even though I do go back and explain. So I'll try to go a little slower when I move my mouse around. Okay, we have my solid cam part. And here we also have the cam settings. Okay, so whichever way you feel is more convenient doesn't really make a difference. They're all actually the exact same button. Okay, so let's click on solid cam settings. And when I click on that, we get our settings as shown over here. Now, what do we have over here? Our first page shows us the following. When we create a new project, where is that new project going to be saved by default? Okay, you can put in any place you want over here. This does that mean that this is the only place you can hold. You can actually save it even while you're creating the part in a different place. But this is just the default area. Okay. The next is something called user directory for additional files. For example, uh, tables, all different types of tables will be located in this area over here. Okay. <clears throat> next, we have this area over here. We have an operation inside Solicam called specifically for uh, thread milling. Okay, so we use standard uh, standard values, and the Excel file for the standard values are located also in a specific area. I you highly suggest that wherever this is, leave it there. There's no reason to really change it. And the last one over here is iMachining database where I actually store, um, sorry, storing all the database for, uh, for iMachining, whether it be the material database or the machine database. And we'll show that as we go into the program exactly what that means, the iMachining database. Next, we have our units with our working in metric or inch as default. Okay, so I can work in both metric or inch, that would be the default, how the part starts. And the next one is the default CNC controller. Excuse me for a moment. Okay, the default CNC controller is basically where I save my post processor files. And what is the default machine I want to start with when I am starting a project? For milling, I can have 
this post over here for turning this post over here. If I open this up, you can see I can choose whatever post I want. This does not mean that while I'm working, I can't choose whichever post I want. And of course, for Milturn as well. Uh, next, we also have uh, G code, where to store our G code. code. Um, you can go through this more in depth on your own. Um, if you have a G code simulator, okay, you such as Very Cut, Eureka, all of these, you can exactly set up your G code simulator in here as well. Next, let's go to the camp part. Now, this has an effect of when you start your part, what exactly happens? We have here something called new camp part and how it's being created. We have two options here, internal and external. What's the difference between the two? First of all, internal, uh, external, when create, whenever we create a new CAM project and we're using external, what actually happens in the project is that we are creating an assembly file. And in the assembly file that we're creating, we get an exact copy of the part that we're starting with. In other words, we're not working on the original part, we're working on a copy of that. So if you make a change on the copy, it will not affect the original. If you make a change on your original, then when you start your project again, in other words, you go back into your project, it will tell you that you've changed your original file and it will ask you if you want to update it. And that's an issue of synchronization, which we'll get on later on. Okay. At this point, note that all of these are unchecked and I'll explain these later on as we go through. One more thing I'd like to go through at this point is the automatic CAM part definition. Right now, I don't have anything checked here, but this thing, can, this can allow you, one, to create a home position automatically, which is nice for demonstrations, but it's not exactly uh, the most useful or most helpful when actually working, uh, because a lot of times parts come in different, uh, are created with different, uh, coordinate systems for instance let's say this part which created where my z direction was from over here instead of going up so when i create it it'll create my home position according to what my cad coordinate system is and that not may not necessarily be what i want okay uh also we have the option of creating our stock automatically and definition of target automatically in general, I like to have my definition of target done automatically. And I'll explain that as we go along. Okay, I'm going to go out of here for now. And I'm going to start a new CAM project. Okay, when I start a new CAM project, again, I can go to new over here. I can also go to uh, new over here, or even over here. No, there's a lot available for you. Why do we have so many possibilities also? Because there are people that do not like working with the task pane. And there are also a lot of people that like keeping this at minimum or, or, or very, and they don't really uh, go to it that often. They prefer not working that way. So we have it here as well. And this will always be here. So I can go to new. Sorry. Oh, I found an issue here. Okay, let's go to new this way. Milling. Find out why that wasn't working. Okay, note when I clicked on new milling, remember I told you external? It's already automatically on external. Okay, what's the difference between external and internal? Internal does not create an assembly file. It actually stores it within 
the SOLIDWORKS part itself. In other words, you're always dealing with only one file, your SOLIDWORKS part. Okay? Next, we have here CAM part name. It automatically takes it from the default of what your part name, your actual part name is. Of course, you can change it, make it any name you want over here. And then we have the option of where am I storing it? Okay. Now you'll note that where it showed me inside the, um, uh, when I showed you these settings, it didn't show it at this location over here. It showed it at a default location. So why is it that it's at this particular location? Could we go down a little bit? We also have an option here called use model file directory. In other words, wherever this model is located, that is where I want to create my project. That's where I want to store my project. Okay. If I were to uncheck this, you see it'll go back to its default location. But again, I can always browse for wherever I want to do it. So it goes, I like to work with use model file directory. This way I know where to find it. And I'm going to click on OK. Now, I want you to notice on top over here, just a moment. OK, let me see if I can move this thing around a little bit. It says here, SLDPRT. OK, the moment I click on OK, I want you to notice what happens. It automatically started to put itself inside an assembly file. Okay? On the left hand side, over here, let me just enlarge this a little bit. It's showing you what my default machine is, which I showed you before. Of course, I can go over here, click on this, and I can actually choose whatever machine I want. But this is my default machine. I'm going to leave it there for now. Next, I like to go into creating a coordinate system. So go to coordinate system. Okay. There are several ways for creating a coordinate system. There's something called select face, define, select from existing coordinate system. In other words, what that means is if I have a SOLIDWORKS coordinate system, I can go there and choose, now we see it over here, and I would click on the coordinate system that we have inside SOLIDWORKS. In other words, if I created a coordinate system there, I can use those as well. I'm going to use for now the option called Select Face. Select Face does the following. First, you'll note that we have a checkbox on pick face okay that means i have to pick a specific face a flat face in this particular case now if i go further down we have where if i pick a face where on the model do i want to have my origin okay we have several options over here we have center of revolution face in that particular case if i hit just a second. If I were to click on, let's say, this face over here, which is an arc, it'll give me the center of that face. Okay? I'm not going to do that for now. I'm going to go to top center of model box. If I click on that, if I click on a face, it doesn't make a difference if I click on this face here or on this face or on this face here or as well. Any of these faces that I click on, it'll give me the home position at the very top of the model and also in the top corner of the model box over there. Now, you may say to me, listen, I really don't want it in this corner over here. I'd like to have it in this corner over here or in this corner over here, someplace else. You'll note that when I created my home position, it also created a temporary bounding box around the part. 
there are several advantages to this. If I want to move it, say, to this corner over here, you'll note that every corner has a point to it, as well as every midline as well, or even mid-surface, like over here as well. So if I were to go to pick origin down the line, okay, pick origin, and click on this corner over here, it will jump to that corner. Okay. I Let's say I don't want my X direction over here, but I want my X direction over here on this line. I can go a little further down over here and I say pick X, Y direction. So if I were to click on that and pick this, as my X direction, you'll note that my X direction is now going according to that line. If I want it towards the other side over there, further down over here, I can say flip it around my Z. In other words, my Z is quite all right, but I want to flip it around. So if I flip around Z, every click on this turns it 90 degrees. So I can get it to that area as well. I'm not going to go too much further into this for now, but I can also modify by delta where I can move it in my X direction a specific amount. As you see over here, and my Y direction as well, or the other way. Okay, or I can put this back at zero. No problem over here. Right now, all I want is that my X direction really should be over there. So I'm just going to flip it around again. And we're all set. Now, basically, this is more or less what I had in the beginning. I just wanted to show you the different options that we have here. Again, uh, I want to remind everybody. Feel free to ask questions while I am working, okay? Um, just a second. Okay, so let's go back to where I was. Now, all right, I'm going to accept it. The moment I accept this, you'll note that the part flips its position to exactly where I want it. And I also want to now pay attention to these, to this field over here. Okay. In most cases, I don't have to really do much over here. So let me just explain what we have over here. The first area here is levels, tool start levels. What does a tool start level mean? When I take, when I'm using a specific tool, okay, I'm getting it out of the magazine, it grabs it from the magazine. Now it's going, it's going to position itself over the part. So it goes in the X direction, goes in the Y direction, and then it goes down in the Z direction. When it goes down in the Z direction, it usually also sets the offset, the depth offset for the part. And it usually does it at a specific level. This is that specific level where the offset is set to. Okay. Next, we have the clearance level. The clearance level is if I go from one operation or from one pocket to another pocket or from one area to another, how much do I want to go above the part before it starts moving? towards that area. This is the area where I take things like clamps or screws into account. For example, if I'm using a vise, I can keep my clearance level pretty low. However, if I'm using a clamps to hold on the part, I want to make sure that I'm going to be jumping over this, the uh, top of the clamps and even top of the screws itself. Part upper level. Next field. The upper level 
of the part as compared to the home position. The home position I could have had also at the bottom. If I would have had it at the bottom, my upper level would not have been zero. Instead, it would have been 25 because my home position was at the bottom. And then my top of Pizarre is 25 millimeters above my home position. There are people who like to work where the uh, floor, okay, of the, they may have, the, they may be sitting on some kind of fixture. The floor of the fixture is where they're doing the home position. Everyone works in different ways, so we have all of the options. Part lower level, you'll note it says minus 25. These values that you see here was taken automatically when I created the home position on the part. It measures the part and puts those values over there. One more field over here called tool Z level. This is usually for when working when in our in fourth axis. What does that mean? If I were to be working, let's say, on this area over here, okay, in this area over here, and I also want to work for some reason on this side over here. So I would have a, another home position for this, and then the part would have to flip in the fourth axis around. So if I only go up 20 millimeters and then start flipping, it's going to crash into the tool. The tool Z level picks up the tool before it makes that turn, and only then will it go into, it will make the turn and go to the next home position. Okay, I'm going to accept what I have here now. Accept this. And I get this window which has coordinate system manager. At this point, if I want, I can also add another home position or edit the existing one. Okay. I'm just going to accept this for now. Exactly what I want, just that home position. Next. Now I'm going to go to my stock. And I'm also going to explain here about the question you guys asked about creating stock. I just have a plain old block of stock, uh, creating it as a model. How do I do that? Okay. And honestly, with the way the program works today, you really don't have to create a physical block on the part. But if you want, you can. And I'll show you how this is done as well. Okay, stock. Um, I did talk about this in, in one of my first sessions about different type of options here, whether it be stock size or, or relative to model. I'm just going to leave it right now at relative to model. Okay. You'll note that my selection over here is empty. I have not selected my part yet. If I were to click on the part, you'll note that it now picked up my solid body. And it's also showing me how much larger than the part it is, okay? I want it to be two millimeters on the each side in X, two millimeters on each side of Y, one millimeter in the Z plus direction, and in the Z minus direction, I want it six millimeters, okay? Now, if I want to have this as a model, a physical model, I just go a little further down over here and it says create 3D model. If I were to click on, click on create 3D model, I want you to see what happens now. I'll click on it. It's actually creating a physical model around the part. This is now a physical model. And it also makes it transparent so you can always see the part. Okay, but then again, I said you really don't need this. And even in the transparent, you really don't need that as well. And I'll show you a little later why. Okay, so I'm just going to accept this. And the last thing I'd like to do is decide what my target is. Okay, my target is the actual part itself. Now, in almost 90% of the cases, the target is the actual part and if i click on it and i do show over here you'll see that is my target 
which is why, if you remember, I said before, I like to have this set, in most cases, to take it automatically so I don't have to go into this field. Okay, I'll accept that. And at this point, all I really need to do is click on OK to start working. OK. Now, you'll note that we're all set up over here. If I go to my SolidWorks um, design tree, OK, you can see that we have an assembly file. You can see it's an assembly. My original, my part, which is a, a copy of my original part, is over here, and it's called design model. That's the copy of the original part. Do not change this name, okay? Also, if you save this in a different location, SolidCam will not allow you to start a new part called design model, because we use this exclusively inside the program itself okay now you may ask where is the location of my uh stock part that i have over here you'll note there's another part here called cam this has to deal with anything that's created by the cam product by solid cam itself if i were to open it up you can see i have one body here and it is my extruded body as you can see over here okay so this is created automatically without me having to bring in assembly files and made it or making configurations i have this here as well now i am going to on purpose uh suppress this i don't want to see it really so i'm going to suppress it there we go suppress i don't want to see it the reason why I'm doing that, suppressing, is very simple. I also want to show you that you really don't have to see that. Okay? You'll also note something here in my cam tree. We have several different options that were created over here, and one of them is called updated stock. Okay? If I were to click on the updated stock, it'll actually show me what my stock is at that point okay this shows me the actual stock so i didn't even have to create that model this is showing it to me okay now this is not a model that i can uh, work on or anything like that this is actually just an stl file but it just shows us the actual stock around the part okay what else do we have here we have our coordinate system manager. If I go and click, double click on it, it'll take me back to the coordinate system manager without going back into the part. If I want to go back into the part, we have also the actual setup of the part at the very top line. If I double click on it, it'll reopen this and I can make changes there as well. Okay. Now, we go over here let's go into our operations i'd like to start off and i like want to explain a little more uh, about the operations itself and let's start normally you'd start with a uh face mill okay i know i did it before i showed it to you also how to do it with drag and drop but let's actually go and create all our operations okay i like to start off today doing at least a face mill and uh, a pocket operation okay so let's go into face okay with face mill we have two ways of creating the geometry the most common way now is using the first option here called stock base boundary okay where it's actually based on the updated stock and the word updated stock is very important why is that important because if i've done machining on this for some reason and then i do my face operation for whatever reason 
it'll raise its boundary according to the updated stock. In other words, if I had machine around this beforehand, and then I do my oper my my face mill operation, the boundaries will be according to the size of the part and not according to where the stock is, was. Because the stock now has been machined up to here. So this is important to note. And what's also easy about this is the fact that when I come into geometry, I don't even have to create one because it's there automatically. Let's go into my tool. And if I go into my tool selection, as I showed you once before, it comes up empty. And I'm going to create a tool. Now, I'm going to use a face mill for this operation. Okay. I'm not going to go into all of these now. I'd like to go into them a little later in my next operation. Let's just say I'm using a 40 millimeter uh, fly mill, a uh, fly cutter. Uh, sorry, not fly cutter. My old days when I used to work in the shop, we had fly cutters still. Okay, of course, I still call it by, uh, <laughs> by uh, force of habit. I still call it fly cutters, but it's a face mill. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave it at 40 millimeters. We can just set our angles up taper angles of, of, over here as well if needed. I'm not going to do that. Uh, since it's 90 degrees, so my tip diameter is also 40 millimeters. Okay. My tool data, control the feed rate and the spin rate. And I can have a different feed rate for finish in XY and a different feed spin rate for finish over here as well. Okay. Uh, if I do not want to work with F and I want to work according to, um, according, to, according to the amount of teeth, so instead of using F, I can go to FZ. And then it'll calculate it according to the, uh, according to the feed uh, per tooth, feed rate per tooth. Okay. Go back here. I'm just going to accept this. For now, level. We'll go into our levels. You'll note the clearance level here is automatically 20, de 20 degrees. Okay, this 20 degrees here, uh, I'm sorry, 20 millimeters here uh, is what you had set up inside your coordinate system, and it, that's where it takes this value from. Safety distance is two millimeters above the depth that you want to start from so for example my milling level right now defined by top of stock which is one millimeter so the safety distance it'll go down in rapid to three millimeters above this above above the part in other words it'll go up to three millimeters which will be two millimeters above the upper level over here okay The depth is set automatically by top of target. If I want, I can use user defined, or if I just go into this field and click on the top over here, it automatically changes to user defined because the user defined the, the depth. And you'll note it also colors this area. And the reason why it colors this area, since I did pick it from a surface, this is showing the associativity to that surface. Okay. Now let's go into technology. In technology, and again, I did talk about this previously, we have several different options. We have hatch, where it goes back, back and forth, as you can see over here. Okay, in a hatch fashion. I can also have it going in one direction. If I go into hatch, the, the, uh, the uh, technology for the hatch itself, I can have it going zigzag or one way. The corners, I can have it as a fillet, as shown over here, whichever way we want to work. Okay. Uh, the other options we have here is contour, contour, 
as you can see in this picture over here, where I was before in a moment, for, a moment, for that moment, shows me exactly what it does. It starts from the outside in. And another option here we have is one pass. If my tool is large enough to cover the entire part, it'll work with one pass over the part. And the way I like working is with spiral. Okay. Spiral, I like to have it roll in. And then it works in a spiral manner of, 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 the, of the part itself. Uh, let me go back to my technology. You'll know also one thing we have over here. We have here floor offset. Floor offset is if I want to go do a rough cut first, I can say put it at 0.2 millimeters above the part and then do my finish. What this does is my floor offset, when the feed and spin rate will be according to my regular feed rate. Remember in my tool, in my data, we have a different feed rate for my finish and also for the spin, different feed rate. So what will happen here is that at this level over here, it'll work with my regular feed and spin rate and the finish, it'll spin, switch to my finish spin and feed rate. Okay. Right now, all I'm going to do is do save and calculate. Okay. Run my simulation. I don't have to, but let's run my simulation. And in my simulation, we have several different types of simulations over here. I'm going to use right now HostCAD, but I want to show the actual updated stock as I'm working. So solid verification over here. I'll start one step at a time. You can see that it's rolling into the part. Let me let it go all the way through. Go a little faster. And you can see it first did a rough and then a finish cut above the part, on the part itself. Okay, if I do this in solid verify, you can also see that a little bit differently. First cut and second cut. Okay, are there any questions up until this point? Okay, again, feel free to ask questions at any point. No. Yes, go ahead. Can we, if required, can we change the spindle orientation of this data, tool data? As far as where, as far as where it, where you want to start off from? Yeah, in tool, in tool data. Tool data, can we change the RPM, feed rates, all these things? Is it possible? We changed it, which the place where we change the feed and spin rate is within yep. the, um, uh from rough to finish yeah that's the only place we we, we changed now for this particular operation and that's what we okay. had over here this is what i showed before i go back into the operation and we go into my tool and we go into our data we have yeah. a feed rate and spin rate for our regular cutting. And then for the finish, we have zero, uh, we have uh, uh, we have 800 for instance over here, and for our spin rate, 4,000. Now, if you're asking that, uh, can I change it while I'm working on the same level? Is that what you're trying to ask? Yeah. Okay, that, yes, yes. at that point, at this point, we cannot. Okay, at this point, we cannot, okay? Uh, however, having said that, uh, later on when we go into uh, eye machining, for example, you'll see over there that the feed and that that the feed rate is constantly changing when you're cutting. Okay, okay? but over okay. here we do not have. This yeah, is a okay. simple operation of face milling. Okay. 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 So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to, um, let's do a pocket. Oh no, you know what? I wanna do the outside 
of this part. And for that, I'm going to use, remember I showed you this last week, but I want to do this, I'll touch on this a little bit today also. I'm going to use what we call eye machining 2D. With eye machining 2D, okay, one of the options that we have over here, and I'll get more into these different options over here as well, something called outside feature recognition, where it recognizes what stock you have on the outside, and it also recognizes the target, because I did, remember I defined my target. That's why it's important to define the target. And it'll automatically machine the outside, okay. In my tool, you know what I'm using something called multi-tool. I'm going to leave it here for now. I'm going to select a tool. And I want to add another tool. I'm going to add an end mill. You note, I want to add, go uh, stop a little bit on this area over here. First of all, you'll note that my diameter and my length are in two separate areas. I can have my length work metric or inch, no matter which system I'm working in. And I can also have my diameter work in metric and inch separately from this, okay? So for my diameter, I'm going to use a inch value and I'm going to put in a 0.5 inch a half an inch that we know if I were to go into metric is usually 12.7. Okay, but a lot of times people have these type of tools, so I'll use this. Now I'll measure it by the outside of the part itself. Usually using some working in metric, I usually measuring it in metric. So I'll say, okay, the total length of my tool is to say 120 millimeters. How much is it outside the holder? I'm going to have it stick outside the holder 50 millimeters. Okay. My shoulder length, I'm going to leave that at 30. And my cutting length, I'm going to say is at 25 millimeters. Now, this over here is the number of flutes. And this is important. Okay. Because since I machining uh, looks at the actually looks at the uh, feed rate according to the number of flutes that you have because they're automatically calculated. Okay, so I'm going to use it say 14. Okay, you'll note that when I go to my tool data, I'm not even going to put in a value over here. Why am I not going to put a value in over here? Because it really has no bearing on uh, eye machining. Why do I have it here? Because let's say I want to use this tool on for later on um, in a different operation that's not eye machining, then it'll look at these values over here. Okay, so I'm going to, ah, I may want to have, add, add an holder. I'm going to add a holder. And in Solid Came itself, we do have a, a holder library. And again, about um, if, if if you have holders, if Vidya also has its own holders and adapters, uh, when in, tw in 2021, in our next version, in our new tool, tool, tool table, if you send us your electric uh, catalog, we'll have your holders in here as well. Okay. So I'd like to use, let's say, uh, my BT40. I'd like to use, uh, let's see, with different types of holders I have here. So I'm going to use, uh, let's go for shrink fit. I'm going to use a shrink fit that is um, I use a half, uh, 12 millimeters. Okay, shrink fit. I'll accept that. I want to do both my rough cut 
which you will do automatically. And I also wanted to do a finish. Okay. Going to my levels, you'll note that my levels, my upper level is grayed out. The upper level is automatically taken to where my stock is at the moment. If you remember, my stock was one millimeter above the part, but I already did a face mill operation. Therefore, it recognizes that there's no material on top anymore, so my upper level will be zero, okay? My pocket depth, automatically taken from here. If I want, though, I can always make it deeper, okay? Uh, I prefer not making changes over here. In fact, I'll click on this bottom corner of the part over there. So I lock it at 25. If I want to make a change, I'll say my delta, I want to go another minus 0.5 millimeters. In other words, to go a half a millimeter past the part itself. Okay. Technology wizard. I started to explain this last week, but this basically is telling me how aggressive do I want to be on the part itself. Okay, you'll note as I change it to be more aggressive, the spin and feed rate and the step over maximum minimum changes as we go along. You can see that as I move it. Okay, back and forth, it changes. Okay, this feed rate that you see over here is not a constant feed rate. Okay, you'll note later on as I'm doing my simulation, you'll see that the feed rate actually does change. And why is that? Because my step over minimum or maximum, okay? Or if I go from view one over to view two, my cutting angle, okay, changes from minimum to, minimum to maximum because we try to keep a constant chip thickness. So to keep a constant chip thickness, and it's changing angles as we go along, engagement angles, our feed rate changes at every single point to keep the chip thickness the same all along, thereby eliminating also vibration. Okay. Technology, I'm not gonna go into all the different fields over here in my technology. I'm just gonna leave it exactly the way it is because you really don't have to do much here. I'm just gonna say, save and calculate. Okay, it's calculating, and I'd like to run my simulation now. And again, I'm going to use it exactly the way it is right now, but I also want you to pay attention now to this field that, has, that comes over here. By the way, this field, you see it, it's controlled by, hold on a second. You'll note on the top is over here, we have a field called show data inside my simulation box you have a box here called show data if i were to click on it sorry click on it the data box disappears click on it again i can see the data box so let's run my simulation i'm going to run it slowly and i want you to note my feed rate at this point it's the same because it's a very constant feed rate. Hold on a second. Let me move it a little faster. But you'll note there are points and all of a sudden it's changing. As the thickness changes, the feed rate also changed as well. Okay? Spin rate is constant, but the feed rate changes. Okay. I'm going to go out of this operation. And I want to show you Remember in the very beginning, I checked this thing here called updated stock. I'm going to click on it again. First of all, it's showing you the updated stock. It also shows you this little icon over here. If I were to drag the icon, it shows you what was done up until that point. Okay? You can see the outside here is not done yet. When I grab it down, Ah, it only shows you that the face went down. It doesn't show you that this went in. Why? Because it shows only the op if the, the operation 
before. If I were to right click on it, I can say include current operation. And then it'll show also what where it is at this point. Okay, so you can always see what the situation of your stock is. And I like this better than creating actual physical stock because this here it actually updates itself all the time. Okay, I'd like to create now, I know we don't have much more time today, but I'd like to create one more operation. Okay, and I'd like to create, go into creating a, a pocket operation. Okay, let me get rid of that stock. I don't want to see it anymore at this point. So I can click on this box again to get rid of it. Let's go into a pocket operation. I'd like to work on this pocket over here. Okay. If I go into pocket operation, you'll note our order over here, by the way, is almost the same for every single type of operation that we have. So there's a constant uh, working flow that you'll always very easily get used to. You'll note, first of all, also, we have our home position. Since I only have one home position, I don't have to choose my home position. Next, I have to create my geometry. New. And we have here something called, when creating geometries, this whole page over here. I can create it by clicking on edges. Okay, I'm not going to right now. And if I click on edges, you'll note that we have here something called uh, pick up anything that's tangent to those edge and also constant Z. Okay. Constant Z. What that means, if I did not have this checked, any of these checked, when I click on an edge over here, it'll wait for my next click. You'll note it's showing me what my options are. And then I can click on my next edge over here. Okay? And then I can keep on going around as it goes along. Now, instead of clicking on these edges every single time, if I go back to this area over here and look at my icons over here, okay, my very first one on the left top over here is called Add Selected Element. You'll see that this element, you can see according to the arrows, is selected already. So I can add by that one, okay? If I click on it, you'll note it automatically jumps to the next one. And I can keep on clicking on this as it goes around, okay? But this is kind of a slow way of working. So I'm not going to accept this now. I'm going to reject what I did here. Let's see what happens if I click on constant Z. If I click on this edge over here, okay, note I'm clicking close to this side, not close to this side, but closer to this side. Click on it, you'll note that it created a chain geometry on this entire area over here, close to that edge. And it asked me if I can want to accept this. Okay, I'm not going to accept this. I'm just going to um, not accept anything over here. The easiest way to work is by using SmartFace. SmartFace does the following. If I were to click on a surface, it'll recognize everything that's on that surface, and it'll also recognize what is open okay you see this edge over here is open it marks it as open it also did not take the holes but it also recognized also these uh stubs that i have over here okay 
and I can accept that. Now, just because I did this, and you'll note over here, because I have this over here, it's saying, okay, this is my surface, so it's going to get this open. I don't have to accept this the way it is. Right now, I'm just going to leave it the way it is because I don't want to go exactly, uh, go away from the actual topic itself. We'll talk about editing geometries at a different point. I'll just accept what I have over here. Tool, I'm going to choose my tool. And remember that half inch tool that I created before? I'm going to use that exact same half inch tool. Okay? I'll accept that. And you'll note when I go over here, after I create, chose that tool, and I go to tool data, it uses the data that I had set up for this tool. Okay? Because iMachining didn't use this, but when I set up the tool, this is what I had. Okay. Levels. My upper level is by the top of the target by default. I don't have to. And my depth was automatically taken from the surface that I picked. Now let's go into our technology. In our technology, I can have offsets from the wall. If I don't want to do uh, finish, I can do point, say, 3 millimeters. And floor offset, say, 0.15. Different technologies of how to work, contour, hatch, okay? This is sort of kind of self-explanatory. Again, I want to remind everybody, uh, if you haven't done this yet, please go into our site and look at the various uh, training films we have there. Now, since we have open pockets in this particular case, we have here a section called open pocket. And with open pocket, I prefer using what they call a profile strategy and always approaching from the outside, okay? Let me just do save and calculate over here at the bottom. And let's see exactly what happened. You'll note that it's working always from the outside in every single one of these areas. And it's also working in a profile type of manner, okay? Doing a profile around those areas over there okay let's do simulate again i run my simulation you'll see it'll work wherever it can work okay for instance this area over here it could not go into so it did the most it can i'll go out of here and if I were to do my updated stock over here and move this down to over here, you can see what has been done up until this point. At any point, I can always go up and down with this, and you can see at every stage what was done at every single level. Okay? Okay, I'm going to stop now for today's session. Uh, my idea now, again, if whoever joined us late, the idea behind these next sessions is to teach the actual program, to go more in depth into the program itself, so you know how to actually work better with the program itself. And again, if there's any specific areas that you want me to touch, uh, like you asked me before about the stock, uh, please also, again, let me know, and we'll try always to touch about touch in those areas. And again, this has been recorded uh, and will be available later on. Now, we will be having, hopefully we will be having a session again next week. The following week after that, we will not be having a session. So we'll be having a session on, uh, on the 7th. The 14th, we will not be having a session, but on the 21st, we will be having a session. Okay. All right. Are there any questions before I end this off? Okay. Don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, again, uh, you can hand your questions in also at any point, and I'll try to go through them the next time we meet. All right, everyone, have a safe uh, 
uh, a safe day, safe weekend, uh, stay home. We have no other choice, and most of us at least. So, uh, and uh, take care for now. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay, you too.